Welcome. This is Microbiology. We'll be looking at Chapter 4 from the Tortura text. And the chapter is entitled Functional Anatomy of Prokaryotic and Eukaryotic Cells. This is a slide that shows an animation when you click on it. And the beginning picture here shows red blood cells inside the bloodstream surrounding a, a much larger phagocytic white blood cell which is in pursuit of a couple of tiny little coccus shaped bacteria. So some diplococci are trying to escape the phagocyte, which is going to hunt down and ingest and digest these little organisms before they have a chance to possibly create an infection in the bloodstream. So I'll make a note here that we'll be looking at this on Zoom. And we'll have a little discussion about the dynamics of our immune defense and comparing these eukaryotic defense cells as they're contrasted uh, to the tiny little prokaryotic bacteria. Now, I'd like to take inventory by pointing out the components that all cells have, whether they're prokaryotic or eukaryotic. So all cells, regardless of their classification, must, at the, at the heart of their genetics, possess DNA. So this is the genetic code that all life forms, all living cells must have. In addition to having a common genetic code of DNA, all cells must have a cell membrane Keep in mind that a cell membrane is not the same as a cell wall. So we'll be going into those details in this chapter later on. Also, all cells must have some form of cytoplasm. The cytoplasm includes the liquid components, uh, the liquid component of the cell called cytosol, as well as the contents within the cytosol. So we have cytoplasm. And lastly, all cells must have a way to make proteins. And that common protein producing apparatus is the ribosome. So many ribosomes are present in any cell type that's been studied. And we'll be looking more closely at ribosomal structure and the specifics between prokaryotic and eukaryotic ribosomes. Here, I'd like to remind everyone of the definitions of prokaryotic and eukaryotic. Prokaryotes are known to, to not possess a nucleus. They lack a nucleus, whereas eukaryotic cells have a true defined nucleus. However, another way of looking at these definitions is to say that prokaryotes lack any membrane bound organelles. Later in this chapter, we'll see that there are many membrane bound organelles that the eukaryotic cells possess including the nucleus, which qualifies as having a membrane and being a membrane-bound organelle. So prokaryotes not only lack a nucleus, but really any presence of membrane-bound organelles altogether. Here we have a list that compares and contrasts the two major categories of cells with respect to their characteristics. Prokaryotic cells have the list of characteristics here on the left column and we can look at how they compare to the eukaryotic major characteristics. 
Starting out, we can see that prokaryotes, the bacteria and archaea have one circular chromosome and it's not enclosed in a nuclear membrane. And when we look at eukaryotic cells, they have paired chromosomes and the DNA is linear. Like in the human genome, we talk about letter X's or the letter Y, as we see the way the DNA is packaged. And speaking of packaging of DNA, prokaryotes do not have histones. Histones are nuclear packaging uh, protein, nuclear proteins for packaging of DNA. And so prokaryotes lack this, this type of DNA packaging. Since they have less DNA, it may not be necessary for them to have such histones. Eukaryotic cells have much more DNA and the histones help with organizing that DNA. Prokaryotes do not have any membrane bound organelles as I mentioned previously. And we know that the bacteria almost always have peptidoglycan by definition, if they have a cell wall, which is the vast majority of bacteria and archaea, which are like bacteria, do not have peptidoglycan, but instead possess a peptidoglycan-like chemical called pseudomurine. And these organisms produce by binary fission. They reproduce by growing longer and pinching in half, uh, I should say symmetrically. Eukaryotic cells, by contrast, have organelles, they may have cell walls, but they're typically made up of polysaccharide sugar, complex sugar type chemical components. And they also possess a mitotic spindle, which we'll look at towards the end of the chapter as we cover eukaryotes. Here's a table comparing eukaryotic cells to prokaryotic cells. And I'd like us to fill this out together during our next Zoom conference. So we'll revisit this slide and we'll fill it out together, help each other to think this one through. Most of our time spent during this lecture will be focused on prokaryotes. And the reason for our extra focus on prokaryotic study is that by comparison, eukaryotes are covered much more in other courses. So if you're prepared to take an anatomy class, or a physiology class or any other basic biology classes that focus more on plants and animals, we'll see that microbiology will focus much more on bacteriology and looking at the finer details of prokaryotes. First, we'll look at their shapes. The shapes also technically referred to as morphology. That means the study of shape. We can first look at the average size. Bacteria are microbiology is centered around the term micro, which means one millionth of a meter. Here we see the letter mu, mu meaning one millionth. The average bacteria are roughly one millionth of a meter in size. And some are a little bit smaller ranging from 0.2 at the smallest, like mycoplasma species, on up to some very large bacteria that we'll talk about later, but average bacteria are about one micrometer. And if they do have a rod shape, like the one we see here in this picture down here, uh, this rod shaped bacterium might be somewhere in the range of six to eight micrometers long and only about a micrometer or two in width. Most bacteria are typically monomorphic, mono meaning one. And this refers to having a single shape. And less commonly, some bacterial species are pleomorphic, pleo meaning variable in shape. These are a little harder to identify because they don't always appear under the microscope as having one consistent shape. An example would be, say, a rod-shaped bacterium that might be a little bit longer in some cases and more slender, but then occasionally could pop up looking more like a spherical 
coccus-shaped bacterium, or even some that are referred to as coccobacilli, as far as the shape goes, but maybe it's all one species that's just appearing in slightly different shape under the microscope. This figure depicts all the basic shapes of bacteria that have been observed. Starting on the left with bacillus, which would be a singular rod-shaped bacterium. We can also refer to multiple bacilluses by its plural word bacilli. Next in the center column, we can see that spherical shaped bacteria are referred to as singular coccus or plural would be cocci. Occasionally I hear students refer to cocci by pronouncing it cocci, but cocci would refer to, it's an informal word for crooked, cocci would be much more readily understood by people who are listening or speaking about microbiology. In the right-hand column, we have several different varieties of spiral-shaped bacteria. And the first example would be bent rods or curved rods, rods such as Vibrio. Vibrio are sometimes referred to as comma bacillus because they can look like a comma. And Vibrio, plural is just Vibrios. You can put an S on the end if you like. Next, we have the spirillum. The spirillum is a rigid corkscrew-shaped bacterium. And the plural for several spirillums would be called spirilli. And lastly, we have the spirochetes. Spirochetes are spiral-shaped bacteria that are flexible when compared to the rigid spirilli. We have the flexible spirochetes. So plural for spirochete would just be to add an S at the end there. Sometimes the name of an organism will also tell us about its morphological shape. So pictured here, we have several rod-shaped bacteria that are String to, strung together, um, and their scientific name would be bacillus, and then the shape also then, the, the name tells us the shape, that they're rod-shaped. On rare occasion, some bacteria are discovered to not possess the traditional shapes that have been described so far. Here, we see an organism that was, di that was discovered in the early 2000s, and its name, its genus name is Stella in reference to its star shape. And several star-shaped bacteria, we'll put here SPP in reference to their various species, SPP referring to any number of species, all possess a gram-negative background uh, in terms of cell wall structure. And they are described to have six prongs that make up their internal assembly. It's a little hard to see in the, in the top orbit. We can see, in this case, uh, internally one, two, three, four, five, six prongs, even though the outer structure appears to have a pentagonal or uh, five-sided shape to it, that they have a three-dimensionally a planar or flat structure to them. And there's not a lot else known about these Stella bacteria, as far as I've read so far. Um, they don't seem to be pathogenic. They're environmental. They've been found in permafrost ice up in Russia. They've been found in soil water and fresh water, even in sewage since then. And um, so they're kind of an unusual bacterium, but they exist. And we know that they're different than all the others described commonly. Speaking of unusual, here are some organisms that at first glance may appear to be rod-shaped, but in fact they're actually more cubical or box-shaped 
and instead of being bacteria that they are actually truly what are known as archaea and so they're in a separate domain they're still prokaryotes and one major genus of uh, rectangular bacteria are the halo arcula and these organisms um, several species of them have been found to inhabit high salt environments like Salt Lake or the Dead Sea, where it was assumed that no plants or animals, fish of any sort, nothing was really assumed to be living in there until we looked under the microscope. And researchers found out that there were these bacteria-like organisms, and some are bacteria and some are archaea, that are flourishing in these very high salt environments. Uh, they're not pathogenic because the human body wouldn't be able to provide the kind of salt necessary for these organisms to survive. Here we look at not just the morphological shape of bacteria, but how they're actually arranged. So we have certain vocabulary terms to describe them, prefixes that are put in front of the morphological shape name. So two cocci are called diplococci, or two bacilli are diplobacilli. We also have the prefix staphylo. Staphylo refers to clusters or bunches of spherical shaped organisms. We don't really talk about staphylobacilli per se, although bunches of bacilli can be arranged in a there are bacilli like organisms that can be arranged in what are called palisades not pictured here and uh, we'll take a look at those later on in the semester for now though we have the staphylococci uh, we don't really say staphylobacilli as a term and then finally we have strepto which refers to strings or chains of either caucus shaped or bacillus shaped bacteria. Here's an illustration of a bacterium that has it all. There may be no single species that possesses every one of these anatomical structures, but we can use this as a diagram to look back as we go through all of these different structures and see where they're located and approximately what they look like if they were on any given bacterial species. As an alternative to looking at a drawing of a bacterial cell, we can just look at the parts listed out in a dichotomous chart like this. On this chart, we see that we can work our way from the outside in, which is how this lecture will flow when I detail out all of the different parts of a prokaryotic cell. Externally, we can look at various parts, followed then by the cell envelope, which is comprised of the cell wall and the cell membrane, and then working our way inward to any various number of numbers of uh, internal structures that bacteria may possess, depending on the species. Over here on the left, prokaryotic cell is spelled with a C. And that is a little bit of an outdated or old-fashioned spelling at this point. Uh, both spellings are acceptable, letter C or K. But since the year 2000, we've seen that most textbooks use a letter K for prokaryotic. So we'll stick with that. Working our way from the outer layers of the cell inward, we'll start with the glycocalyx. If a species of bacterium has a glycocalyx, it would be described as a gelatinous external layer made of a complex sugar like a polysaccharide or maybe a complex protein based structure called a polypeptide which is less common. The two major types of glycocalyces are the slime layer which is described as being a bit more loosely organized than attached and so its chemicals can be stripped off or slough off more easily when compared to a second type of glycocalyx that's referred to as the capsule. capsule is, the capsular layer is, much, layer is much more highly organized and tightly attached. And the capsule has 
a short name. Some people alternatively refer to it as the K antigen. And so we have the slime layer or capsule layer for the glycocalyx if, it, if it's on the bacterial cell. Not all bacteria possess the, this particular layer. The functions of slime or capsular layers will be discussed together. And there are many functions. First, we can focus on the stickiness, the ability of bacteria to adhere to surfaces in their environment or on tissues within the human body. And they can, they can be a source of major medical problems because the primary treatment for bacterial infections would be antibiotics. And unfortunately, bacteria that can produce slime or, or capsular layers will have an increased ability to resist antibiotics. Not so much in their singular free floating existence like uh, we see over here in the, uh, the lower figure, we see some bacteria that are in a cap. So we can see these singular bacteria over here. This, these bacteria would, are said to be in what's called a planktonic form, free floating bacteria that are separate and if you were to treat these with antibiotics, they would likely respond to antibiotic treatment and be killed off if they were the cause of an infection. However, bacteria that have glommed together into a film with several layers of slime or capsular protection, uh, that's a very different story. Bacteria that are in a biofilm are protected in such a way that our book's author says they are estimated to be as much as a thousand times more resistant to antibiotic treatment. Another function that can be uh, thought about when describing bacteria that have slimer capsules is the uh, antiphagocytic capabilities that they possess. So phagocytes, which are white blood cells that are supposed to patrol the body's tissues and bloodstream would seek to identify foreign bacteria and, and first recognize those bacteria. So we would call this phagocytic recognition. And then the ingestion, this is another key issue with phagocytes where they have to be able to ingest or acquire their bacteria that they've targeted to remove and then digestion. There are several functions that at each level may be defeated by the presence of a slime or capsular layer. So bacteria may not be as easily recognized uh, because the slime or capsular layer disguises them or makes it difficult for phagocytes to see. If the phagocytes do recognize that there are bacteria there, the ingestion or the acquisition of the bacteria could be difficult because the bacteria are sticking to a surface or they're housed underneath layers of protection in a biofilm. And lastly, even in the case that the phagocyte has a chance to ingest, it may be difficult in some cases to digest these bacteria that are coated in an extra slime or capsular layer. We can also say that environmentally, the presence of such structures will allow the bacteria to resist dehydration. So they won't dry out as easily. They're longer lived out in the external environment and they may also resist disinfection. So in a medical setting or some other setting where people are trying to apply chemicals that should destroy bacteria on contact, the disinfectants may be reduced or defeated in terms of eliminating the bacteria. And the same would be said for antiseptics. Antiseptics, which are chemicals formulated to have 
that are safe for human tissue contact, skin, wound care, etc. Antiseptics may have a reduced effectiveness when we're trying to tackle the treatment of bacteria that are under such protective layers. The formation of biofilms occurs over time, sometimes very slowly, and the onset of biofilm formation is most often from the adherence of so-called first colonists. These would be bacteria that are classified as producing capsules or slime. And so these capsule producing or slime producing bacteria will adhere down or attach themselves to surfaces that are typically organic. So pick your organic surface, whether it be tissues of the human body or perhaps inanimate objects that are organic like cotton, which can make up fabrics or wood or plastic. And if these surfaces are continually wet and in contact with a, a moisture source that may also contain some nutrients and some contamination, then biofilms can begin to develop. And slowly, over time, a monolayer of bacterial slimy organisms will then build up more layers. And then eventually a fully formed biofilm may very well include many different species of organisms until you get a complex intermicrobial community that forms a layer so thick that by the time you feel such a structure with your hand, if you were to run your fingers over it, that would be at least a half a millimeter thick. And that's, that translates roughly to about 500 to perhaps even a thousand microorganisms thick. Biofilms are defined by our textbook as complex intermicrobial communities. Uh, they're in slimy layers called hydrogels where there's a lot of moisture and typically we have a continuous moisture content and these bacteria can communicate via a, a sensing mechanism called quorum sensing where they may have a cell to cell signaling and even three-dimensionally at the microscopic level, what we're seeing is, is that biofilms are not simple mats of slime layer upon layer, but that they form in these piers where there can be flow of nutrients and exchange of waste. And so some species may produce waste that actually becomes energy or fuel for other organisms. And so then we see these pier-like structures that build up and they can break off and they can spread to other areas. And so biofilms can become quite thick and complex. And these biofilms, by the time you can feel the presence of a biofilm, would be somewhere in the range of half a millimeter thick. And at that point, we're talking roughly maybe 500 bacterial cells thick by the time you can detect without a microscope that there's a biofilm forming. There are many sites within the human body where biofilms have been commonly found to form. Some might be considered normal and some of those sites may actually uh, be the site of severe disease. One of the common places that we find them naturally present forming on a continual basis are the teeth. So inside your mouth you have to brush and floss and go see your dentist regularly, or these bacteria that are slime producing can start to build up. And if they harden over time, you get plaque and tartar, tartar and um, it can be difficult to get rid of. Occasionally, people will get bacteria in their ear canals. And so you can have a tough to treat, um, what's called otitis media, which is a ear infection or you can have bacteria getting into the nasal or sinus passages. People could sometimes end up with a pesky sinus infection. Also, we find that in the GI tract, the gastrointestinal tract naturally has beneficial bacteria that could be classified as being in a 
continuous biofilm associated formation. Although sometimes abnormal bacteria, such as the ones that cause C. diff, Clostridium difficile, we'll learn more about that later in this chapter, and these organisms can cause severe problems in the GI tract because they form a biofilm that's difficult to get rid of, but also disease causing. The genitourinary tract can be a problem. There are certain sexually transmitted infections or even ones that are not necessarily considered STI, STDs, but just the cause of uh, UTIs. And there can be problems there. We also see that biofilms can form inside of various medical devices, such as intravenous tubing. So patients who are receiving antibiotics or other drug delivery through plastic tubes. Speaking of plastic tubes, you can think of catheters as being a major source. Perhaps that's the number one source of bacteria infecting people who are hospitalized. And another possibility would be implants. So various medical device implants, anything from a pacemaker to a stint or a heart valve of some sort, or maybe even a cosmetic implant, sometimes these sorts of devices can become fouled and uh, sites of biofilm formation. And sometimes they get rejected because the body is fighting a, a problem with bacteria that have contaminated that surface. And over here on the right, we see a picture of some lung ciliary tissue that's highly abnormal. Uh, inside of your airway, you have lung cilia. And these lung cilia are fine little hair-like projections that help to keep mucus moving along and moving it up out of the lower respiratory tract so that fluid doesn't collect down in the lungs. And these lung cilia are pictured from a patient who has something called cystic fibrosis. And cystic fibrosis is not something you can catch. This is a disease that is genetic. Someone has to inherit this from their parents. You're, you're born with it. And cystic fibrosis causes a condition where the people who suffer from it are have excess mucus secretions, including in their airways and their lungs then become overly mucousy and bacteria can take advantage of this. And the most common one that is the most frequent cause of death in cystic fibrosis patients is called pseudomonas. Pseudomonas, cystic fibrosis pseudomonas infection is a source of deadly biofilm that ties up the cilia, makes it difficult for the fluid to, to be cleared out of the lungs and the person can develop then pneumonia where fluid builds up to the point that the person is not able to survive uh, the rising tide of, of fluid that can build up then. And it's very, uh, notoriously drug resistant. Pseudomonas being in the biofilm is very difficult to treat. So we have lung cilia in a cystic fibrosis patient. Pseudomonas biofilm is present. The picture on the left is a scanning electron micrograph, highly detailed three dimensional photograph taken of the inside of a catheter, specifically a urinary catheter where very commonly patients can have bacteria that start to infect the urinary tract because of plastic tubing that's put into place to relieve a person of urinary function, uh, most often when they're in a nursing home or a hospital. And these bacteria over time can build up and it appears to be staph bacteria that are here. And you can see the labelings uh, on the right glycocalyx slime and these bacteria are very difficult to treat because of their shielding within such an environment. And the fact that if it's in a tube, it's difficult. Um, you have basically have to change that plastic catheter tube. And here I have a space to list for you guys to list the advantages.
for bacteria that are in biofilms. But if we really just refer back to the list on slide 17, which is the functions that were discussed, same as the functions for slime or capsule producing bacteria, then we'll be good on covering that subject. This is referring to slime or capsule production, which leads to biofilms. There's a memorable acronym a phrase that'll help us to memorize most of the genus and species that are well known to produce capsules or slime. And it reads, some killers have pretty nice capsules. So the first letter of each word here refers to an organism that you should take special note of. The S is for streptococcus pneumoniae. Streptococcus pneumoniae would be the most common of all the species of bacteria that can cause pneumonia, which is dangerous fluid buildup in the lungs of infected patients. So approximately 80% of all bacterial pneumonia is caused by this genus and species. And elderly people are particularly at risk for Streptococcus pneumoniae infections. And you should also be aware that there's a vaccine for this. It's called the PPV vaccine, also known as pneumovax. And this will be discussed in a slide soon in this chapter. The K is for Klebsiella pneumoniae, yet another cause of dangerous fluid buildup in the lungs. But this is from a very different bacterial cause. And I say it's different because Streptococcus pneumoniae up above here is a gram positive organism that's cocci chained together in, in strings, a strep. Um, and then Klebsiella are actually little gram negative rod shaped bacteria. And there is no vaccine for Klebsiella pneumoniae, unfortunately. And many strains of Klebsiella pneumoniae have been the cause of death in recent years due to the notorious antibiotic resistance that these gram-negative bacteria have. Next on the list, we have Haemophilus. Haemophilus influenzae. And you can tell by its species name, influenzae, that this is an organism that was once thought to be the cause of the flu. But we now know that the flu is caused by a virus and influenzae is the species name here of a bacterial cause of flu-like symptoms that is very commonly a pathogen in young children. Most adults who would encounter this or carry this would be asymptomatic and uh, children, on the other hand, especially those under the age of five, can get very dangerous, uh, if not life-threatening infections with Haemophilus influenzae. And fortunately, we do have a vaccine for it. It is called the HIV vaccine. And HIV stands for Haemophilus influenzae type B vaccine. And this is a preventative measure then to guard against not only uh, possible deadly pneumonia, but also in advanced infections, little kids will typically die of complications like going septic or even getting a brain infection called meningitis. Uh, next on the list, we have Pseudomonas. The P is for Pseudomonas, which we saw on the last slide in reference to a major pathogen in cystic fibrosis patients and its species name is aeruginosa. And we do not have a vaccine for Pseudomonas aeruginosa, 
but it is a, a gram-negative rod-shaped bacterium that we'll see studied in lab as a model organism. Um, and uh, so you have Pseudomonas. It produces slime, uh, where, whereas most of these other organisms are capsule-producing organisms. But we're still going to put it in this list of some killers have pretty nice capsules. And then finally, we have Neisseria, or I should say next to last, we have Neisseria under letter N. And there are two species I'd like you to take note of. We have Neisseria meningitidis. Sounds like I stuttered, I'm sure. Uh, but actually, if you pronounce its name fully, it's meningitidis. And you can see by its species name that it leads to meningitis in the worst of cases. And so bacterial meningitis, this can be vaccinated for. There is a vaccine called the meningococcal vaccine. And this vaccine is very important, especially in um, young people, even on up through college age. There have been cases, outbreaks of meningitis, where young people living in college dorms or high school kids, where you, you've got people in close contact and kissing or sharing food or things where salivary exchange could be very likely, um, meningitis can be passed. And speaking of passing Neisseria, there's another species of Neisseria that's also very serious and I'm sure the whole world wishes that we had a vaccine for Neisseria um, gonorrhea. Gonorrhea is one that has a very unusual spelling too. Um, spelled here as we see. Um, this is the cause of gonorrhea and there's no vaccine. In fact, not only is there no vaccine for gonorrhea, but there are now notoriously drug resistant strains. In the last few years, there have been news articles about people who have gonorrhea that isn't responding to any antibiotic treatment. So they're really cursed with something that they could pass on to others. And the same thing would be true for anyone who is comp who's colonized with this form of gonorrhea that is not responding to any drugs. And finally down here, the last letter is in reference to something called Cryptococcus. Cryptococcus neoformans. And Cryptococcus neoformans is really unique in that it's not a bacterial species at all. It's, uh, it's a yeast, which is fungal. And this fungal yeast is found in pigeon droppings. That's the most frequent place where it's been researched to have been found. And it's not a very common disease, but when people get what's called cryptococcosis, it can cause a deadly pneumonia. And it's most commonly, it most commonly occurs in HIV AIDS patients. So people with this viral infection called human immunodeficiency virus they will have an acquired immunodeficiency syndrome called AIDS. And this is one of the major AIDS defining illnesses that has been a frequent cause of death in AIDS sufferers over the years. So uh, it's very important to understand uh, Cryptococcus neoformans as a fungal cause of uh, you know, encapsulated organisms here. And, what do we see that's in common with all of these different organisms? You should start to see the common theme, which is that most of them, almost all of them, are respiratory pathogens. And it seems that there's a prerequisite for respiratory pathogens to produce capsules and or slime to not only stick in the respiratory tract, but also to be able to evade phagocytes. This is a case study with a list of facts taken from our textbook. And I'd like you to review these facts. And next time we meet, we'll break out into some Zoom groups
and we'll discuss the answers to these questions as a class. This next section will detail the motility structures in bacteria. Motility refers to the ability for bacteria to move. So we'll write down here cellular movement or ability to move. Not all bacteria have the ability to move, but if we say an organism is modal, it must have some sort of structure or mechanism by which it can move about in its environment. The major motility structure of most bacteria that can move around in their environment is the flagellum. And the, fl the bacterial flagellum comes in three main parts. Number one, we have the filament. And this is a structure that is made up of bacterial protein subunits called flagellin. And these flagellin subunits form a helical structure that, is a, that manifests as a whip-like tail that can be used to whip around and propel the bacteria through the environment. And that filament is attached to what's called a hook. And the hook is an elbow-like like structure that the filament attaches into. And interestingly, if the filament was to break off, but the hook remains, the hook will be able to grow back a new, a new filament, just like a lizard that could lose its tail, but then eventually heal and grow back a tail. And connected at the base of this structure, the hook will then uh, attach to what's called the basal body. And the basal body is the anchor. This is what's housed down in the bacterial cell wall and cell membrane and it varies based on cell wall and cell membrane structure so we can see that gram negative cells pictured up here in this upper picture have several rings in their basal body some of those rings are used to anchor the flagellum into the cell membrane and then there's another basal body ring that's in the thin layer of peptidoglycan, and yet another ring, a fourth ring, in the outer membrane. When we look at the basal body of gram-positive bacteria, there are only, there's only a, a pair of rings down in the plasma membrane, and then none apparently have been found in the thick layer of peptidoglycan. So a little bit of a difference there in the two basal body structures of gram-negative and gram-positive prokaryotic flagella. How those flagella are arranged can be defined as monotrichous, lophotrichous, amphitrichous, or peritrichous. And really, mono just means singular. So if you have one polar flagellum like this, then we have a monotrichous organism, by example. Lophotrichous, on the other hand, refers to like a ponytail structure where you would see a gathering a group of flagella all just at one polar end of an organism so pictured here this is, would be typical of an organism like helicobacter pylori we're going to talk about h pylori as an organism that can infect the stomach and they swim around using little lophotrichous flagella and then Thirdly, we have amphitrichus, which means that one or more flagella can appear at polar ends of the cell. By the way, this word tuft means a group. We can talk about one or more. If it's one, then it would be a single flagellum at both ends, but more would be a group, and that grouping can be referred to as a tuft. And finally, if, if there are flagella all over the organism, we get peritrichus here, which is this type in panel A that says 
Peritrichus. They look all hairy. And these are the best swimmers because they have the most flagella. And interestingly, they can braid those flagella together into uh, like a giant apparatus for swimming and propelling themselves through their environment. When bacteria use flagella, they do so by rotating the flagella, spinning it around like a jump rope, like an outboard motor, and they'll rotate their flagella counterclockwise. Interestingly, all species that have been studied rotate their flagella in the same direction, and during this run, they'll continue to move positively towards a food source, for example, or away from a stimulus if it's something they're trying to get away from. But as long as they sense they're making progress through some sensory mechanism, they'll continue to run. If at some point their sensory mechanisms begin to sense that there isn't a stimulus anymore, then they'll reverse that flagella to a clockwise rotation just temporarily so as to break up the spinning motion and they go through what's called a tumble. And so as long as there's a stimulus that they turn on their run for, then they'll keep running. And if they, if they start to tumble more often, it's because they're no longer sensing that they're making progress in a given situation in which they're moving about. And this process of running and tumbling is called a random walk. And the random walk involves running as much as they feel that they're making, as they sense that they're making progress. And when they tumble, when they're not making progress, they'll eventually end up where they want to be without having any eyes or ordinary sensory mechanisms in the way that we think of it as humans. Yet they can still make their way to a stimulus or away from something if it's negative uh, as an impact on them, like an antibiotic or a waste product or something, and they're trying to get away. Speaking of moving away or towards something, uh, this process is collectively referred to as chemotaxis, positive chemotaxis towards a stimulus and negative away from a stimulus. That's maybe something dangerous. Also, we can talk about phototaxis as in attraction towards light stimuli. Flagella, the proteins involved in flagellar structure, as in the filament, are referred to as H antigens. And specific H antigens have been characterized in various strains of E. coli and Salmonella and many other flagellated pathogenic organisms. And the seventh H antigen is infamous in the deadly E. coli 0157H7. This is a strain of E. coli that's been found most often in cattle. So cows on farms can carry this, whether they're symptomatic or not, it can come out in their feces. So cows have a lot of waste and this can then either be present in raw meat occasionally and so hundreds of millions of pounds of ground beef have been recalled from all the major meat packing companies. Um, e. coli 0157 has been found on romaine lettuce, baby spinach, alfalfa sprouts, many different types of produce where it may be produce that's not cooked or that's going to be served just lightly washed and put on the plate. And if these E. coli are present. Sometimes people come down with um, what's a form of kidney failure called hemolytic uremic syndrome. And this type of kidney failure is frequent in young children um, and, uh, and it can cause a deadly episode. It can cause a person to be go septic. And for this type of bacteria, ultimately, to be very dangerous. And so we, we have to have ways of identifying it. And so H7 refers to the seventh flagellar antigen that was described in combination with the O antigen, which says O157. We'll be talking about the O antigen later. So I'll leave that off of the description at the moment.
a modified type of flagella referred to as an axial filament or an endoflagellum is a type of flagella that's wrapped around spiral shaped organisms, the flexible coil shaped spirochetes. And it's said to be anchored at one end of the cell. And when the spirochete flexes the endoflagella, it causes them to move in a corkscrew like motion through their environment. And it allows them to propel themselves through water containing environments, but also it allows them to penetrate through mucous membranes and skin, especially in the genital area. And so you have transmission of diseases that are aided by the axial filaments action like syphilis, the cause of, um, I mean, the organism Treponema pallidum has the axial filament that it uses to, to corkscrew into the skin and um, and into the mucous membranes of the surfaces that it comes into contact with. Uh, pictured here on the right uh, of this diagram, we have a, with a slide, we have Leptospira, which is an interesting spirochete-based disease-causing organism that is transmitted through animal urine. So certain infected wild animals, rodents, um, even higher animals, I should say larger animals like hogs, wild boar, um, deer, you name it. These organisms can be out in the environment and they, they have leptospirosis and their urine will have these infectious spirochetes. And if you go swimming in fresh water where these animals have urinated, or if you're a hunter and you hunt one of these animals down and, and use, you know, slaughter it for food, then sometimes contact with leptospira can result in an infection. It comes in through the eyes or the mouth or ear, nose and throat, mucous membranes. And these leptospira then can infect the blood and cause very similar symptoms to syphilis and also Lyme disease, which is another spirochete based organism. If you recall from lab, Borrelia burgdorferi, and these organisms um, come in through the bite of a tick, but all of them have this endoflagella in common, um, also known as axial filaments. Another bacterial appendage that some bacteria possess are fimbriae. And fimbriae are not flagella. They don't move around like flagella. They're not built like flagella. They're actually described as fine proteinaceous spikes these spiky protein based uh, structures they project and they stick into surfaces so down here in panel b this picture shows some e coli cells stuck along the brush border of the small intestines labeled here intestinal microvilli and these e coli are most likely normal flora and they're found inside of each and every one of us to help in our digestive processes, but the way that E. coli has become so intimately colonized and part of the human intestinal microflora is by their ability to stick onto our tissues in, in the intestines. And it's due to their fimbriae that are able to insert themselves and, and give them a nice way to hold on instead of just being flushed along with the rest of everything else that moves through a digestive tract. So it's considered a, an adherence factor and a bacterial appendage. The last bacterial appendage that I'd like to look at in this chapter are pili. Singular would be pilus. This right here is a pilus. It's a, it's a long tubular appendage, appendage called a sex pilus multiple sex pilluses or pili. And it seems to be something that only gram-negative bacteria produce. So it's been observed in gram-negative bacteria where a donor, probably most likely this organism that we see on the left in this picture, is using this 
sex pillus to copy DNA after making the pillus. It can copy DNA from its cell and send it over to this organism over here on the right, which can be referred to as the recipient. Now I make the assumption that in this picture, the donor is the one on the left because it appears to have something that the one on the right doesn't have. And in the previous slide, we saw that these spiky-like projections called fimbriae could be an advantage for a bacterial cell to stick to its environment. So maybe, just guessing, this donor has the genes, the DNA necessary to produce fimbriae, and it could be copying some of that DNA to produce fimbriae over to this recipient. Now, after this interaction, the recipient may be observed later to produce fimbriae. And so almost like magic, fimbriae may start to grow and appear on the recipient cell after such an interaction. This particular process, if it could be entitled by one single word, would be conjugation. Conjugation is sex between bacteria. They don't use it to reproduce, but they use it to share information. And besides sharing information from donor to recipient through conjugation, pili are also found to be a part of motility where bacterial movement, not due to flagella, but perhaps movement referred to as gliding motility or even twitching motility are types of motility where bacteria seemingly move and we know it's not through flagella but the mechanism is estimated to be um, pili based and so pili play an important role as bacterial appendages in gram negative cells gram positive cells on the other hand do not make pili but it doesn't mean that they miss out on conjugation. Surprisingly, uh, gram-positive bacteria can still have a sexual encounter, but they do so by moving right up next to one, one another. Um, and instead of having a pillus, they just form what's called a mating bridge, and a donor can copy DNA from, from the donor to recipient. Here's a question that we can save for our next Zoom conference. So we'll come back to that later. And now we're going to cover the details of the bacterial cell wall. First off, the function generally for the bacterial cell wall is to provide an extra layer outside of the cell membrane. Don't equate the cell wall with the cell membrane. We need to realize that the cell wall is a separate structure and it gives the cell shape and, and structure, rigidity. It is important in protecting bacteria from a hypotonic environment. Um, hypotonic is a term that we need to define, so I'll make some space for that in the next slide. Essentially, if bacteria encou encounter a hypotonic environment, and their cell wall is damaged or gone, then they could fill up with water and eventually burst. And the reinforcing structure chemically that gives strength to the bacteria is mainly the peptidoglycan. And most often I label that PG. This peptidoglycan will give the cell wall the strength that the bacteria need um, to survive their environment. Speaking of since one of the major functions of the cell wall is to protect from a so-called hypotonic environment, I'd like to take a moment out and just ensure that everybody understands these terms, hypotonic, hypertonic, or even isotonic down here. So let's start at the center of this picture. We have this, I just did a rough drawing of an average cell, whether it be a human cell or a bacterial cell, most cells have approximately 0.85% salt inside of them, sodium chloride. So just a little less than 
Now let's take this cell at 0.85% salt and place it into an environment where there's a lot of salt, maybe more than 10 times the amount of salt. So if we said 10% salt environment, the one rule that we would need to remember about salt is that salt sucks. So there's a lot of salt out here. There's a lot less salt in here. And the salt will suck the water out of the cell and the cell will undergo a loss of water. And when cells lose water, they tend to shrivel up. And so we can call this shriveling. Or if it happens in the bloodstream and cells start to lose their water and shrivel up, the, the red blood cells are said to crenate. You know, so we, we call that crenation. Alternatively, on the other hand, if you take a given cell type and you put it into an environment with very little salt, maybe it's 0% salt, like distilled water, or or even just a tiny bit, like a tenth of a percent of salt, like we see here. And again, what's the rule? If we say salt sucks, wherever there's more salt, in this case it's inside the cell, it will then draw water towards it. And so the greater amount of salt in here will take on water, suck the water in, and then this cell would actually start to swell up. And that's assuming that there's no cell wall. The cell wall will actually stop the cell from doing, from filling up with water. Otherwise, it'll take on a, um, a lot of water, a gain of water will occur, and something called osmotic lysis could occur, and the cell will then burst if it has no protection against a hypotonic environment. And then the last case, which is the ideal happy place that cells want to be in, would be a 0.85% concentration of salt. And this would be then equal. And it doesn't mean that water will not flow in or out. It just means that there'll be an equal flow of water, no net movement, and therefore no loss of water and no gain of water. And so an isotonic environment would be ideal. One thing that additional piece of information you need to know from this figure is that the cell membrane itself, not the cell wall, but the cell membrane is what's called semi-permeable. And what that means is, is that water can move freely and permeate through the cell membranes, but the salt stays put. So if you ever encounter any questions like this in your future, realize that the salt does not travel, but the water does. And what's the, what's the rule that directs us to the proper prediction? It's salt sucks. So wherever the greater amount of salt is, the water is going to flow towards that. Let's take a close-up look at peptidoglycan structure, the molecule that is primarily able to give the strength to the bacterial cell wall structure. It's considered to be a polymer of disaccharide modified glucoses. Disaccharide means two sugar molecules. One is called NAG N acetyl glucosamine and the other is called NAM N acetyl muramic acid. You don't necessarily have to memorize these complex names N acetyl glucosamine, but if you simply refer to it as NAG and then that it's attached to something called NAM, the NAG and NAM alternate by hundreds or even thousands to make up very long strands of peptidoglycan structure that then contribute to the, to the cell wall build. And this picture takes it further. We can see the strands of NAG and NAM alternating NAG, NAM, NAG, NAM here and here. So we, we see three strands in this figure taken from our text. And then hooking these strands together are these cross links called tetrapeptide cross bridges or side chains. And peptides are amino acid based. So they're protein based structures that hook together those modified carbohydrates. And this is what makes up a single layer of peptidoglycan in most bacteria, whether they're a gram positive or gram negative. This is what peptidoglycan would look like as a single layer 
Here we're going to take a look at a comparison between gram-positive cell walls and gram-negative cell walls. The gram-positive cell walls, visually, you can see a thick layer of peptidoglycan that's colored brown here. And I'll abbreviate that as thick PG for peptidoglycan. And by comparison, the thinner brown layer that's pictured here for gram negatives, we'll say thin PG. When we look at gram positive cells, in addition to their thick layer of peptidoglycan, they have tychoic acids. And these are molecules that extend through the thick layers of peptidoglycan in order to stabilize it and to help attach it to the under underlying cell membrane that gram positives have. And, uh, and so that's unique to gram positives. Tychoic acids are not found in gram negative cells. However, gram negative cells have an outer membrane that the gram positive cells do not have. And that outer membrane has specific components to it um, that we're going to take note of here. The outer membrane has something called LPS, which stands for lipopolysaccharide, as we'll see. And that LPS contains a toxic cellular component called lipid A. Lipid A is also referred to as an endotoxin. And this can send people into a, a form of toxic shock that uh, can be life-threatening. Oh, I've misspelled that. Endotoxin. So we'll take special note of that as it's a danger with gram-negative bacterial infections. In this slide, we're taking a very close-up look of actual bacterial cells that are gram positive here in this picture and gram negative over here in this picture. And then just to the left of each picture, we see some little drawings for clarification of what the layers look like of the gram positive and, and, um, and gram negative cell envelopes. Um, in the gram positive, we can pretty clearly see the evidence for the thick peptidoglycan that's been computer colorized, normally these cells would be clear, but we can see the brown layering that they've put in here to this photograph. And this was taken with an electron microscope. So these are magnified millions and millions of times. And then over here, we can see that by comparison, the very thin layer of peptidoglycan and the presence of the outer membrane beyond uh, the, the peptidoglycan on the gram negative cell wall structures. Now. In addition, I'd like to also add some labeling to this, to um, the lipopolysaccharide and the lipid A and such. And so what I would like to do is actually include this in our next Zoom. And the reason for that is I wanna make sure that we get a chance to do this together because these are important points that everybody should encounter um, as a class. So we'll take a look at this together. And um, looking specifically at gram positives, we can take um, a closer look at tychoic acids uh, besides just looking at the thick peptidoglycan. There are two types of tychoic acids. You have wall tychoic acids, And the wall tychoic acids help to stabilize peptidoglycan in general. And also there's a modified type of tychoic acid called a lipotychoic acid. Lipo in reference to a fat containing or lipid containing component. It's added on to the basic structure of the tychoic acid. And these lipotychoic acids are uh, used for attaching the peptidoglycan to the cell membrane. They help to make it so that there's some cohesiveness between the cell wall and the cell membrane. 
So we can say cell wall has a way to be attached to the cell membrane. Okay, and tychoic acids are also said to be antigenic. And what that means is that when the human body encounters tychoic acids in tissues that are actively released by the immune system, like in the, in the bloodstream or in, inside of tissues, organs that are not supposed to have any kind of bacterial presence, the tychoic acids will be detected as something foreign. And that term that we use is antigenic. Antigenic can refer to any chemical or substance that causes an immune response. And this must be a type of evolutionary mechanism that our bodies have adapted to, um, to defend against the presence of bacteria, even normal flora that could be on our skin surface or somewhere in our bodies that then gets into places it shouldn't. And so then the immune system snaps into action to respond to the presence and eliminate these bacteria say if they're gram positive, so the tychoic acids get recognized. Gram negative bacteria have a much different cell wall. And so we can look at the complex layering here. We have a thin layer of peptidoglycan, but then we can see the outer membrane on the upper surface here with the uh, LPS that I had referred to in previous slides which stands for lipopolysaccharide. And within that LPS, there are three components. You have the O polysaccharide and then a core polysaccharide. And we're not gonna really highlight those all that much, but we do wanna pay special attention to this toxic component called lipid A. And the lipid A causes a lot of pathology and in some cases, destabilization of a patient who can then go into shock. And this is in response to overwhelming amounts of gram negative bacteria that sometimes get into a person's blood or into various organs in the body. As we take a closer look at the finer details of the gram negative outer membrane, we can say in general that the outer membrane helps in protection against phagocytic action Phagocytes may be able to defeat gram-negative bacteria, but not as easily as gram-positive bacteria by comparison. So the outer membrane is a bit of an obstacle. It also has been shown that complement blood defense proteins are not as effective at working against the outer membrane of gram-negatives. We'll talk more about complement proteins during the immunology chapter and antibiotics in general many antibiotic classes are repelled by the outer membrane because many antibiotics are water soluble and the outer membrane has a lipid rich content and so water soluble antibiotics may not cross through the outer membrane of a gram negative cell in order to treat it and perhaps the worst aspect of the outer membrane of a gram negative is the presence of lipid A, also known as endotoxin. So lipid A, which is part of the lipopolysaccharide, it's a component. Initially, it doesn't make any, it doesn't produce any symptoms in the patient who's infected, but it doesn't take long for bacteria to start dying even if it's just due to old age. Within 48 to 72 hours, bacteria may start to deteriorate. Plus you have in an infection, the dynamic that the immune system start to break down these bacteria and cause them to die. So we can start here with bacteria uh, gram negative cell death. So if when a gram negative cell dies,
then the lipid A is released. And when lipid A is released as a free floating molecule, it results in fever in the human body. So this is a familiar symptom to bacterial infection in general, but the fever results ultimately from lipid A causing the release of cytokines, specifically one called um, interleukin-1. And we'll talk more about that later as well, but it travels to the brain and causes the hypothalamus to elevate the, the basal metabolic rate of a person. So they run fever. And in addition to fever, if this particular process continues and more lipid A starts to build up, a person may begin to experience blood vessel damage. So the blood vessel damage starts to occur in the smallest blood vessels. So think about the blood vessels in the body that are the most delicate, where blood, where blood cells line up in a little single file line through the capillaries where oxygenated and deoxygenated blood exchanges and so the little tiny delicate arterioles and venules start to break down and a person can experience tingling sensations and problems in, the, in their fingertips and their toes and the tip of their nose uh, any of these places where blood vessels are fine and start to leak and the consequence of this this blood vessel leakage is that a person's blood pressure will start to drop and this makes sense because as the blood vessels leak there's no longer going to be a normal amount of blood pressure and if this continues on then the heart rate will begin to respond by elevating and this is sort of paradoxical because you have a situation where the blood pressure is usually the blood pressure goes up when the heart rate goes up but the heart is trying to compensate for leaky blood vessels and the dropping blood pressure and so at this point doctors could recognize that a person is showing signs and symptoms of shock however if antibiotics aren't appropriately given then this can continue on. Sometimes people aren't even at the hospital or the emergency yet. And um, oftentimes people can be discovered to already be entering into the next step, which is called disseminated intravascular, which means inside the blood vessels. Disseminated means spreading throughout the body internally in the blood vessels, there can be coagulation. And what this is from is blood clotting. There can be inappropriate blood clotting factors that lipid A can bring on. So in general, we're talking about blood clotting and this is not blood clotting to stop a cut from bleeding. This is indiscriminate, inappropriate blood clotting. And the, this disease process is referred to as DIC. When a patient enters into DIC as a condition, um, they're identified as being truly in a state of shock. And that shock rapidly needs to be treated and reversed or a person can just lose consciousness due to a, a severe drop in blood pressure circulating blood clots and um, and really if, if things don't turn around this can be a deadly scenario and so antibiotics and supportive therapy um, to, to uh, monitor the person's blood and vital conditions are necessary to pull someone out of such a tailspin and gram negatives can take this course and within a few days someone can go from stable to gone and so this is something that everybody needs to realize with respect to understanding the seriousness of gram negative infections and um, we can also talk about another aspect of gram negatives beyond the lipid a that the outer membrane has what are called porins and these porins are referred to as 
highly selective. Yeah, let me put a put a line along here to, to divide this content. Okay. All right. So porins are highly selective. channels in the outer membrane. Highly selective channels. We would say that they're semi-permeable. In the outer membrane. And this has significant consequences when, with respect to drug susceptibility. Turns out that bacteria that mutate their porins may become more selective and then less receptive to certain antibiotic treatment. Outer membrane porins, by the way, are sometimes referred to as OMPs. And that's just another way to refer to them, outer membrane porins. Here's a fascinating diagram and figure uh, photograph on the right of a gram-negative bacterial cell that's been specially stained where all these tiny little black dots actually are making visible lipid A and so this is a gram negative bacterial cell undergoing lysis and all these tiny little molecules of lipid A are disseminating. They're floating off into the environment. And this is what brings on the signs and symptoms of shock that were described in the previous slide. And over here to the left, this is showing some of the specific chemical structures that make up lipopolysaccharide LPS. But instead of memorizing all these little details, I wanted to at least show you this very memorable uh, picture that shows the lipid A being released as a gram-negative bacterial cell dies. As a quick review, let's make sure we remember some of our laboratory learnings about the gram stain. So we know that the gram stain does not tell us about positive or negative charge. We can say that the gram stain is telling us that about the cell wall structure. So gram positive cells are purple because they retain the crystal violet and they stain purple, just like we see on the left-hand picture. Whereas we know that gram-negative cells lose crystal violet, and when they decolorize, they still will take on the pink coloring that comes from the safranin, ultimately, which is the last step of the gram stain, is to put on that pink, reddish pink dye. And, oh, why don't we just call this pink? There we go. And we know that the gram stain is really important in classifying bacteria and identifying bacteria and also very much um, a way of guiding drug treatment, at least from the outset. And then there are more specific ways to do what's called culture and sensitivity later on after the gram stain. And here's just a, a quick review diagram showing the different steps of the gram stain. Everybody should be aware of the four steps and how they work and how long they should be performed for. And that wraps up the gram stain.